Sadhanand Kumba, and he is um, a candidate for the biliteracy seal for the state of New York for his diploma due to his um, language abilities in both Swahili and English. So because New York is a pilot for this project, we are actually creating the method of bestowing this honor on students who qualify to their grade point average and um, many other criteria and also they can either write an essay or create a project. And Masada has decided to create a project, so his project is a play, both in Swahili and in English. The characters are fictional, but the events are really based on life as he knew it in the Congo. So it's all about the corruption in the Congo, and we'll let Masada start out with a brief introduction of himself, a little bit talking about his project, some of the resources that he used to create his project, some of his beliefs and his hopes from this project, and his feelings about the process. And after that, we'll have an opportunity to do some questions and answers. We can ask him questions about the project. And then he, at the end, we will go off as a committee. We'll use our rubric to evaluate and make sure that all the criteria has been met to bestow this honor on Masada. So without further ado, I'm going to let Masada stand up. Uh, my name is Masada. And uh, he said, I would like to start by giving. Uh, no, we don't have to train you. Okay. I would like to start by giving a, a brief history of myself. I was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, uh, well, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a country in uh, Africa. It is uh, the second largest country in Africa. For that, uh, we got our independence from Belgium in 1960. And uh, in 1965, we had a uh, a coup d'etat which resulted into a dictatorship which lasted for around 33 years. In 1994, 1994 in Rwanda, there happened a big uh, political event which was called as the Massacre of Rwanda. The massacre resulted into many people losing their life, around 1 million. So, uh, and uh, the end result of it was the, the, the conflict was between two tribes, that, that was Hutu and the Tusi. The Hutu were the ones which were in power and their leader was shot, the plan of their leader was shot, and he died, which was called uh, General Habiagimana. After that, the Hutu turned and killed the Tusi massive. They killed Tusi, many Tusis, but at the end of all, some neighboring country supported the Tusi and they forced the Hutu to the Congo forest, the Hutu militant which perpetrated the massacre. So, and since then, having those Hutus in Congo, we have been having a lot of problem because they have been disrupting the peace of the country and uh, the people in general. So, I was born in 1997, and uh, that was like three years since we had the Hutu fled to Congo. Mm, now, in, in December 1997, Rwanda government, in collaboration with uh, some Congolese refugees from uh, Tanzania, they sent they send them to go and attack the Hutu in the Congo forest. That resulted in a war which started when I was born. So my life has been, I was born during the time of war in Congo, and uh, since I was younger, I was just known life living in forest, hiding. So, but what happened is that the, 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 the rebellion was to go and attack the Hutu, but it turned to a national rebellion which overthrew the dictator, which I said took power in 1965. So, uh, I remember time, uh, oh, yeah, I was very young, I was four years, but uh, my parents still can tell me more about it. When I was four years, actually our village was invaded and around 76 people were killed, of which 36 were just from my family. That was a great loss, but uh, it was a great loss, but we were lucky that we didn't actually pass away in that case. Now, when I was eight years, I also survived a massacre. I myself had gone with some peers of 
mine we were like I was eight years, we went to a Christian ceremony and we traveled using a bus. All my peers were killed, it was not the hood, but there was another rebellion in Congo which was called Majimaji Rebellion. They actually killed everybody, we just survived that. I and another child who we were the only survivor and uh, we were rescued by the Red Cross and taken back home. So I've seen a lot happen to my family and uh, just other people in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our house was burned. Everything we had was taken away. I have seen people in my family subjected to the rape. So what I have just been talking about in the play is something which I have experienced. And uh, now we made our way to Kenya as refugee. It was a great luck that we met uh, each school and found ourselves in Kenya. Since then, uh, we spent some years in the camp. I never had uh, an opportunity to go to school in Congo. I started my education in class 7, in grade 7. It is like grade 7, and that was in 2010. That was my first time to get an opportunity for education. So, the country Congo, we have a lot of troubles, and uh, since we were the United States allowed us to come and pursue our dreams here, that was in uh, September last year that we got to this country and uh, I got the opportunity to come to Lafayette, which I liked much. Uh, and coming here I found this opportunity of biliteracy, the seal of biliteracy, of which uh, we had some option to, to explore. So there was essay option and a play option. So I decided to pursue the play because I had that idea. Since from all the experience that I had in Congo and what I've been seeing, I always say I would one day when I get a chance of writing something, I will have to write about all what happened in Congo and just some other countries in Africa. So for that I decided to pursue. I didn't actually know what it was, but because I was trying to ask my mentor and she would also say basically this is the first time for this here in the New York State to be introduced, so uh, we don't actually have much, but we can try to work together and uh, believe that we will be so. So I decided to write in Swahili, because Swahili is not my mother tongue, it's a language which I also learned. My mother tongue is called Mashi, and I speak around five languages. So for that, uh, the process was somehow challenging at first, but we were determined to go through it. So. We decided to pursue it. Uh, I started the writing in uh, Swahili, the play, and I did it by hand. I write the first draft, I write the second draft in Swahili just using my hand, and I also translated the same in English using my hand. Then, after all, we came together, we talk, we we'll meet and talk about over the process. It was challenging, but with uh, her and other people, we could actually. Yes. So the source of my information, I didn't actually rely on my own experience. Because they normally say that uh, two hands are better than one. So I had other elders from my community who have also gone through the same thing. And my parents also, I relied on them. I would ask them questions. I used the internet, watched a movie, famous movie like the Hotel Rwanda, to get information about uh, the situation in Congo. Uh, moreover, now the process actually I can say it was actually it was fair. It was fair. It, was, it is the first time but it is good because it gives us the opportunity to be creative and actually use our time well. Because I believe that uh, when we have such kind of activity, I can't find myself into trouble with doing something which will not add value to my life. So I said that the process is good and uh, we hope that next time it will be more, better than it was. So, and uh, I propose that if it would be good if the New York State could start giving people this idea in, uh, in June or even just over the summer so that people have a lot of time to plan. We had a rough time somehow to plan all this information, and, uh, but we made it, but we would like make it smoother for the people who are coming after us. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome on the question.
will start with questions. If you have questions, anyone have questions for Masada about his play? I have some questions. It's a biliteracy uh, diploma that you're pursuing, but how many languages do you speak other than, I heard you use the term coup d'etat. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Masada. So how many languages do you speak in, in total? There are like five languages. Those I can speak well like that. Five. And those English, English, French, Swahili, and uh, Marsh, which is my mother tongue. I said English and uh, the flavor. Your English is excellent. Your articulation is, is remarkable. You should be very proud of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, I taught myself English. First. I, the way I learned English was very fantastic because uh, in the camp, sometimes it's hard to get somebody to teach you. And, uh, but I was lucky to have a, a Bible in Swahili and a Bible in my mother. And I would just compare verses in Swahili and in English. Uh, in Swahili and, uh, and in English. That's how I learned English. I make my own book, a notebook, copy this word, I just translate, and I later I find myself actually learn some English, and that's how I actually learned English. Any other question? Um, you said you didn't start school until seventh grade. Yes. Is that, that's when you started to learn Swahili, too? Yep. That's when I started learning Swahili. How, okay. uh, how is the education? In Kenya? Is that in Kenya? Yeah, that's in Kenya. Different than it is here? Yeah, it is very different in many ways. Yeah, first of all, the, the relationship between teachers and students is very different. Yes, teachers are very liberal, they interact with students, but in Kenya, teachers are always very, they put themselves on a different ground with students, so you can't just interact with a teacher in that way. And the teacher are very, sometimes they are aggressive, they beat students, they can students. So I've never seen a, a teacher caring a student here. So moreover, here I think in Kenya they, they try to make people learn by memorization. Here I think people learn like practical, practically. Also, but any other thing is okay, they are almost the same because the curriculum is almost the same, but it's a bit different. What did you find to be the most difficult in translating from Swahili to English when you're writing? Yeah, the most difficult thing is that, uh, you know, in Swahili, there are some words which are actually, you can't actually translate them directly. That's some, that's the part which I found difficult. There are some things which have actually, they have their own uh, meaning. You feel it better if you speak it in Swahili. But if you translate it, like uh, there is a phrase that I translated, a dying ear that's not ear medicine. That one, <laughs> that's a direct translation. But I couldn't actually get the what I don't know if that exists in English. A dying ear doesn't hear medicine. It's still a cook and speed down. So, that's the most difficult part. Some phrases in Swahili are hard to translate. Because when you translate them, they lose that, the weight of their meaning a bit. They kind of lose it. Yeah, that's it. Any other question? I have a question. Yeah. I know in your play you talked about the women united together and um, never being alone to avoid rape and to try to support each other from inside um, their groups. Do you see, what do you see as a solution to some of the difficulties and the problems in the conflict? Do you think it's that banding together of the people themselves or is there some way to actually change the government and the politicians? Well, as I explored there, most of the problem that we currently have in the in our African or developing nation is that leadership. Yeah, because uh, it is leadership. The, the reason of uh, the government is that it helps people make their life smooth. So I think we cannot make a, we cannot actually solve our problems alone. We cannot say that our problems are solved if our leadership is bad. 
So the first step to solve those problems, I think, is getting first rid of burden of leadership. And I don't say that uh, people should start again another or coup d'etat so that they get rid of those leadership. But uh, uh, currently we have democracy spreading all, of, all across the world. So to say that maybe in the next election of people may try as much as possible to vote uh, good leaders. Mm -hmm. And after that, those leaders will support them. And uh, the, the idea of unity is very important because find that uh, many of the women's problems are being solved. Sometimes they find themselves together, they motivate each other, they encourage each other, they help each other. And that's how actually people get along with life. I have a question, Masada. I have a thousand questions for you. I'll start with one, all right? I've already asked about a million, all right? It, it's uh, a line from your play. And I'd like you to answer this through the lens of what you would like to do with your uh, future and your education. Yeah. Right? And you write, what we do to ourselves dies with us, but what we do to others is immortal. Yeah. Well, that's a good one. It is. It's <laughs> 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 an underlining. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I know, my dream and aspiration is to be a doctor. And uh, I choose that one from the experience that I had in the refugee camp. As I said, I had done some volunteer work at a clinic. I used to help people doing first aid, helping patients, those who couldn't actually walk. That's what I used to do in the refugee camp during my free time. And moreover, I also had an experience because my father was a medicine person, he was a traditional medicine person in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I normally see how we treat people. People get well, they come and thank him. And uh, I think somebody feel better. If you help somebody who was almost dying and they are getting better. So that's something I, I use to, to develop my interest in, uh, in my career. So I choose medicine because I think it is a way of helping people. Yeah, that's why uh, in relation to that line, I think, yeah, even if I may have a lot of things, wealth, they can't benefit, it can't benefit me much if I don't actually help other people. So that's why I think my career will be serving people. Serving people every time, helping people get well. Sick people getting well, that's good. Everybody, everybody needs good health. And if somebody is having a good health, they are happy. There is nothing good than that. That's my career. Please. I'm trying not to, to, to actually break down in tears, but um, <laughs> I, I have to ask, say this to you. Um, I feel like you're 50 years old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you, you've lived this life before, and um, as your principal, I'm, I'm so very proud of you standing and saying what you're saying. Because not only are you going to leave a legacy, you are living, you are living legacy. And um, it is amazing to hear your story, your personal story, but then connecting it to, um, it on paper and making it um, an archive. Um, whether you have written it in a fictional sense with the names changed, it is a historical account. Um, I'd like to know that when you had conversations with your elders, did you even learn more because you were so young when all of this happened? Yeah, I learned, I learned more. <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you can read uh, my reflection, the last page of my reflection, I said uh, mm -hmm. I'm very glad for this uh, kind of opportunity because it has given me the opportunity of learning more even about myself mm -hmm. and my country of origin. Yeah. Elder people are always resourceful, and I always say that. We, we young people can't be elder, wiser than them. They have a lot, and uh, I learned more from them. Even from my parents, I learned more. When I ask them questions, things that I didn't understand. You have heard me talking about the, the history, even from when we got independence. I was not there. All this information I got from them. I didn't go to school in Congo. But all that I got from them. 
So I learned a lot of things from elder people which I interacted with during the process. I have one simple question. It, you talked about the music and how you got information from the music and the songs. Mm -hmm. Could you just elaborate a little bit more about the music? Yeah, we have uh, many political music in Congo, and uh, I think in the whole country, in the whole Africa, Congo is the one which has the very strong music industry. So we have very, very many musicians in Congo. And uh, many of them sing political songs. Sometimes music play a very, very big role in politics. And uh, I listen to many music like Kutia Tiberia, Kilio Ya Congo, Kilio is like Moon of Congo. We talk about, it condemn many of the problems we have, political problems. So from those songs, I can get ideas of what is happening around. Yeah, and that's what I did. Well, I'm Mr. Damlis, thank you for coming to my name. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, Marge is just a little bit common, and that question for you later on. So uh, I, I'm very happy to come back here. I used to work here as a academic coach uh, at uh, Lafayette High School. Now I'm a teacher, a full time teacher at uh, Mac School, Mac Institute, School 86. Um, and I was very pleased when I was informed to come to you today by a liter uh, literacy uh, panel. Uh, um, First, I'm so inspired by your, um, uh, uh, by your work. Uh, I read both of them in English and Swahili, mm -hmm. and, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Kenya. First, my question is, where, where in Kenya did you come from? And uh, what school did you go to Kenya? Yeah, in Kenya, I came from uh, the northern part, uh, Turkana County. Uh, this is the, the name of it? In Kakuma. With Kakuma, Kakuma. Okay. Yeah. okay. I knew you would say Kakuma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, what school did you go to? I went to Unity Primary School. Unity Primary School? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I did my education in grade 7. You know you were not primary school? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's what I teach. I teach there. Oh, great. <laughs> so I started actually my school school too in Kenya. So, and I, and I quite understand when you translate, you know, a language from another language, it's not easy. It's very, very difficult. So, I'm so inspired by your work. So, okay. uh, yeah, work hard. Congratulations. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got a real quick one, which is sort of a question and a comment. Um, you write plays, and then this is sort of dovetailing off your, your music um, anecdote that you're a musician as well, are you not? And don't you also write songs about social injustice? And So what do you do in your spare time? So? <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. do to relax. Well, uh, my music uh, talent, I'm actually, you know, my songs, most of my songs are in Swahili. And uh, now what I'm doing, I'm trying to compose some English, so because here yeah, nobody knows so any. So but it's a bit challenge to compose in English, but I'm trying. So that's what I'm doing. But I'm also I'm still learning guitar because guitar has a lot of things. So I play, but I'm still learning. As and as I told you, I have somebody around whom I'm working. Yeah. So <laughs> who, who is your famous musician in Congo? Nikongo. Okay, my inspiring my inspirational musician was Luambo Makere. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I think he's the father of Congolese music. Yeah, yeah Willow and Lumba and all those people. Yeah. <laughs> Congo actually is the leading country in Africa in terms of music industry. Mm -hmm. It's a leading country. Yeah, I see. Let me uh, ask you a question. So, you say I'm from Kakuma. Which part, you know, you from near the Don Bosco or Kakuma 4, Kakuma 2, Kakuma... Which part, you know, area, you know, you're from? Me too. I'm from <laughs> Kakuma, you know. Mm. I'm from Kakuma 4. Mm. So, um, a lot of Sudanese over there, a lot of Somalis mm. over there, Congolese. So, which part, which area that you located in Kakuma? Okay, me, I came from Kakuma. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, so yeah, 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 yeah,
But learning in the refugee camp is something which is very hard. Because life is not that easy in the camp as well. So sometimes you don't go to school. Sometimes you struggle for water. There is no water. People go and dig water from a seasonal river. So it was very challenging, uh, but we were struggling to go to school. Sometimes you don't go. <laughs> sometimes you go. So, when, when did you come to Kakuma? Sorry? When did you come to Kakuma? From Kakuma? When did you come to Kakuma? I think that was in 2000, close to the end of 2009. Oh, that was a good time. Yeah. It was really bad before that. 1992, 1993, 1995, it was really terrible. Yeah, yeah. Was good. Love of sun. It was very hot. It was very, very hot. Extremely hot. <laughs> <laughs> Love of sun, sun, sunstorm. If there is rain, it is very severe. It, it uh, wash away all your residence. <laughs> if you were to recommend uh, this process to students behind you that come behind you, what would you what would be your advice to them? My advice to them would be to be positive, just to be positive and uh, focused. Yeah, and also to be creative because it is not easy. Yeah, sometimes when I have the pen and start thinking, what am I going to write? <laughs> so somebody has to be creative. Creative and positive, not to lose hope because sometimes when during writing, people sometimes they, they lose hope. So people they don't need to, and they have also to use their time well. They use their time well, be creative, work with other people because it is hard to work alone. So and uh, so that they can also do well. That's my advice. If there are no other questions, I am actually going to ask Ms. Hooper to take Masada out for up just a few seconds and then we will make sure that the rubric has been fulfilled with the criteria.